Okay. So, yeah, so today what we are going to do is go through the very basics of uh, laser and laser beam and how uh, that laser beam uh, width, uh, the, the width of a laser beam, how that is actually measured. So there are several methods for doing that, but uh, there's one specific method that, uh, in fact, two, uh, that you need to do as part of this experiment. I mean, experiment-wise, if you were doing this in the lab, it would have been very, very easy, but... Uh, I think since we are doing with the uh, you know, constrained set of uh, uh, resources, I think it will be uh, interesting. Let's see. Uh, so I have planned that we'll go through the mostly the explain the theory and uh, you know how that works, and uh, the the simple. This is just will be kind of suggestion as to how I would set it up. Uh, so I'll give some hint, but then I think the uh, exact working you will have to figure it all out. So, uh, so let's get started. So, uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think most of it you should be familiar with already, uh, but I will go through it and probably some of it has already been also been uh, uh, covered in the, in the theory part of the course. Uh, so, but I'll just go through it and make, uh, you know, kind of uh, make it complete. If somebody has a question, we can, you know, spend some more time on that part if, if needed. Okay, so people who are joining, just uh, unmute yourself. Sorry, mute yourself unless you have some question, in which case, you know, you can just unmute and uh, present your question. Okay, so uh, I'm hoping if you, yeah, that you can see my screen. So uh, this, this is about measuring a laser beam width. So first of all, uh, what I have written here is the Maxwell's equation, rather the wave equation. So that this, everybody, I guess, is familiar. This is the electric field, ERT, same electric field. And then we have this del square minus one over C square D square. That's the, this whole thing is zero. So that's the wave equation. So this probably you have worked it out, uh, you know, in, in, in the course or somewhere. Now this, again, I'm not going to, this, this is a very long derivation, but I'm just presenting it to kind of connect it to the uh, uh, main thing that we are doing. Uh, most of it, what I'm doing here, you can find it in the uh, manual, uh, the, the, the lab manual. And some of it, if it is not there, you can probably, uh, maybe I'll show you a book uh, after a while. This is the Laser Physics by Miloni Ebert. Or any laser physics book, I think it should be there. Okay, so this is the wave equation. Anytime you have any wave propagating from point A to point B in space, it will be governed by this equation. There is no exception to this one. So, but this is, this, this governs the three-dimensional, three-dimensional field. So this, sorry, maybe the four-dimensional we can say. R is three-dimensional and one is time. So uh, uh, three-dimensional space and time. Uh, this this uh, uh, equation actually governs how in three-dimensional space and time, you have the electric field propagating. In fact, the same equation works in quantum mechanics also as well, where this E will be pretty much replaced by the wave function. But again, we are not going to go in that direction. So uh, this, is the, this is the wave equation. Now, if you're assuming, or if you know that the field that you're dealing with is actually a monochromatic field, that means it has some space dependence, but the time dependence is essentially of the type E to the I omega t. Okay, I mean, a, in, in general, a field will depend on both R and T in the most general sense. But suppose if, if you have a field, suppose if you have a field uh, for which the space dependence is, you know, uh, general, but the time dependence uh, has this form. 
uh, e to the i omega t. So, and the omega is single valued. This is just one value. So, this is a monochromatic field. So, if we have a monochromatic field, then for that monochromatic field, this wave equation becomes, you can write it like this. Uh, so, del square e r, uh, this e is, is uh, this e over here. Uh, uh, and then this k is omega by c. Omega is a frequency. And this equation is called the Helmholtz equation. I think some of you might know, or most of you might know. This is the Helmholtz equation. This is the wave equation for a single frequency. Okay. Now, so th this was the first assumption. Uh, now, if you have that the uh, space part, this e to the r, sorry, e not e to the r, e r, the r dependence. If that r dependence is of this form, that means you have some function of r and then e to the i k z. So the, the, uh, the k, the z dependence is mostly of this type. Okay. There is some z dependence in here as well because we are still writing r, but uh, this is the most prominent z dependence that we have of this field. Okay. So in addition to this, if we have this and these two, These are called paraxial wave equation, sorry, paraxial approximation. I will not explain too much, but you can see this, this basically uh, uh, is, is related to how the field, I mean, E still has, E still has a Z dependence, but let's say if that Z dependence, the first derivative is much smaller than the uh, K times E, the, the magnitude of E. And the second derivative is, is much smaller than the k times the first derivative. So if this essentially means that the field is not diffracting too much. The, the, the deviation is not too much and it is going in one direction. So when we have field like this e to the r, uh, there is no sense of direction. The field can be in any direction. But if we have a field of this type, that means this, that, and that, then this actually represents a field that goes in one direction, in fact, in Z direction. So if I am to kind of, uh, you know, draw this field, it will be something like this, okay? So like a beam type. So this is, that's why this is called the paraxial approximation. Paraxial means it is closer to the Z axis. So if, if this paraxial approximation is, uh, if, if this is there, then one can write this Helmholtz equation in this form. That means second derivative of x, second derivative of y, e naught r plus twice i k del del z e naught r. So uh, uh, here you have all the three derivatives, uh, no, no, no differentiation. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, your del two, del, del two by del x two, del two by del y two, del two by del z two. But here we have, we don't have any del two by del z two because of this approximation that we have done here. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and, and so with these approximations, that is a paraxial approximation, we can essentially write the field like this. Sorry, we can essentially rewrite this equation as this, and this is called paraxial wave equation. Okay, so this is the wave, wave, full wave equation. Uh, anybody has any question? Okay, there's something in the chat. Let me just quickly take a look. Sorry, I have not received the lab kit yet what should I okay so how many people have not received the lab kit yet can you just raise your hand <clears throat> okay I don't see too many hands raised that means most people have received it so whoever has not received it uh, you can just write to uh, uh, Upendraji and then we'll see what we can do. Okay. Uh, so, but, but uh, so, now, yes, Aditya. Yeah, yes, sir. sir uh, in this paraxial appro approximation, why it is uh, multiplied, the man man E naught magnitude is multiplied by Q. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Aditya, I'll just come back to you in one second. So again, uh, those who have not received the kit, uh, write it to Upendraji and then we need to, uh, min, but because by now everybody should have received the kit. So if you have not, write to Upendraji and then we'll see what, what, what we can do. Now, coming back to Aditya's question. So again, I have not explained it properly. 
so it is uh, so what, what what was your question again aditya so the question was why why the magnitudes are multiplied on one side by k like what why is it required okay to, okay okay so uh, see it is not that i'm multiplying this side or that side it's like if you expand this equation and well is a like two page of derivation so in that it turns out that you know if if you have these conditions it is not that i am uh, you know artificially putting it but it is that if you do have this condition okay if you do have this condition then you can rewrite this equation as this i mean this is the kind of uh, short and quick answer i can give uh, but uh, but i i don't think this is a very convincing answer the most convincing would be the if you you know if i expand this for a field of this form and then we will see that the, the, these terms show up and then we see that these uh, uh, this particularly means that in the first derivative the rate of change of e as the first derivative that is smaller than the k times this and the the second one is this so essentially the beam is not deviating too much diffracting too much and and, and that basically says the beam goes in one direction and that's the paroxysmal approximation so i'm saying if this is true if these two conditions turn out to be true then you can write this one as that is that is that fine again this is without giving the whole derivation is, is are you happy or yes yes sir okay fine that's fine okay so so within this approximation and we'll see that there are certain physical situations in which these approximations are actually valid so within those approximation this helmholtz equation can be written like this and this is then called paraxial wave equation because this essentially represents a field uh, going in the z direction which is mostly of beam type okay now uh, this is a, a second order equation and so one again there could be several solution i'm not going into the you know how to solve this equation and so on all i'm saying the one solution to this equation you know the one solution to this equation uh, has this form uh, so here i'm just writing out the solution i'm not deriving it so one solution to this equation is this let me just center it huh? so now you see this is the e x y z first of all i have removed the t component t we have we dropped it here itself because the t dependence only comes like this so this is the e x y z e r uh, and so we have this i mean you can verify i mean that's the that's the best thing best way i can actually put it you can verify that this indeed satisfies this uh, paraxial wave equation so one solution to the paraxial wave equation is this and this is called the gaussian beam solution we'll see why this is called a gaussian beam solution but you can see its dependence there is this constant term oops there is constant term uh, then there is uh, uh, w not and then w as a function of z then we have this term which is the exponential i type with kz minus 5z uh, i think i'm missing something here Then there's another uh, e to the i type term, which is this. So e to the i k x square plus y square twice r z. Again, we have another quantity r z here. And finally, we have a quant uh, one term which is doesn't have any i. So we have this e to the x uh, i minus x square y plus y square by uh, w square z. <clears throat> so this is called the Gaussian beam. And if you have a laser pointer, I mean the laser pointer that we have sent in the kit, that is mostly of this type. this very uh, that led laser beam is a very good approximation of of this field i mean it won't be actual but the if uh, i mean if, if you have a perfect single mode laser then it will be exactly of this form but i think this is not a perfect single mode uh, so but but this will still be a very good approximation to this field okay so from the wave equation which is the which which handles any general field i'm saying if you have a single monochromatic frequency then this can be written like this with if if the field if the z dependence can be written like this and in addition we have these two uh, paraxial approximation then this helmholtz equation can be written like this which we call paraxial wave equation and one of the solution to this paraxial wave equation is this which is of gaussian uh, form so there can be thousands of thousands of solution to this one you know and then this is a very limited uh, uh, version of this equation and one of the solution of this is uh, you know this so uh, this is a very very particular solution that we are talking about we are not talking about how to solve this and what are the general solutions for uh, that equation okay 
So since, uh, uh, I mean, most, most of the time what you have, uh, whenever you deal with the laser, this is mostly the field that you have, if it's a single mode laser especially, okay? So let me explain what this is. Uh, there, there, are, there are several different terms in here. Uh, well, uh, let's start from here. So Z naught, this is essentially a constant. And uh, you see this is, Z naught is omega naught square and lambda. So lambda is the wavelength. And so this is not omega, sorry, this is W naught. What is W naught? W naught is the width of the beam at its waist or the minimum uh, uh, beam size, which I will explain through this diagram in a while. So uh, uh, then you have WZ or maybe I can explain it right now. Okay, so let's say this is the laser I have. Okay, this is, this is the face of the laser through which you have this uh, beam coming out and this, this is the transverse size of the beam. I mean, transverse size of the beam here is this, transverse size of the beam is like this because the beam is kind of uh, diverging. That's, the, that's how a uh, laser beam always diverges. That's because of the uh, diffraction limit. So that's the, uh, that's the laser beam we have uh, coming out. Okay. Uh, now, <clears throat> see, this is the smallest size of the beam, right at Z equal to zero. This is the smallest size of the beam. So uh, the smallest size of the beam, which we, all, which we also call beam waist, uh, that is W naught. The W naught is the half width, actually. W naught is the uh, size of the beam, the smallest size of the beam that is possible. Okay, uh, so that was this W naught. And with this W naught, you construct a parameter called Z naught, which is called the Rayleigh range. Uh, Rayleigh range is essentially, you could see this is uh, like a distance in Z by which the beam becomes uh, root two times its size. I mean, uh, th th so th th this just gives you a sense of, um, you know, how quickly a beam diverges or how slowly a beam diverges. So this is, this is the kind of fundamental limit. So if the beam is of this size, beam waist, W naught and lambda is the wavelength, then Rayleigh range is uh, pi W naught square by lambda, which is this over which the beam will become from W naught, it will become root two W naught. The, so W naught is the size of the beam at Z equal to zero at or at its waist, but at any z, so this is the z direction. So at any z, what is wz? The wz is given by this formula. So w squared z, that is w naught square one plus z square by z naught square, where z naught is this Rayleigh range. Okay, what is r? That <coughs> r shows up here. So r is called the radius of curvature. So uh, this is the radius of curvature of the beam. So I think that the name explains it. Uh, and since we are not using it too much, let me not go too much into it. Then we have this phi. Uh, phi shows up here in this phase uh, factor. It is the i k z minus phi z. This phi is tan inverse z minus z naught. This is called the GUI phase. I think this has a lot of uh, uh, use if you want to introduce a geometric phase. Again, in quantum mechanics, quantum information, people use this a lot. There's so many applications, uh, several applications based on this, but again, I will not go too much into it. Finally, we have this theta naught, which is called the beam divergence. So, so it is, it is uh, you know, how, how a beam diverges. And then you can see uh, this theta naught is essentially from the center, you know, if you draw this asymptote, I mean, this is how the beam is diverging. This is how the beam is diverging. And then if you draw an asymptote, and you see that finally the beam is doing like this. Okay, and so this half angle is theta naught. So you can see this half angle theta naught, this, this theta naught that we have is essentially, you can get by this taking the tan of, uh, 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 you know, the tan, uh, 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 I mean, for a smaller theta, you can just write it as uh, 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 in, in the limit z going to infinity, uh, uh, wz by z. So this is wz, by z so and then that is a theta naught so, so that gives the divergence and um, for again a uh, gaussian diffraction meter beam this is given by lambda by pi uh, w naught uh, 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 that is the uh, beam divergence okay so this is the basics of uh, what is a laser beam laser laser mode 
and uh, you know different parameter that uh, uh, quantifies the laser beam. Any any question until now? Sir, could you explain uh, why the beam diverges? I don't understand. See, beam diverges uh -huh. because of uh, why? Why does the beam diverge? Beam diverges because of this fundamental thing called diffraction. So it's like uh, if you if you send a, I mean, you have done the single slit experiment, no? So when you when you send the beam uh, through a slit, I mean, you you have a nice field, whatever is coming from the laser or whatever it is, uh, and that if you make well, let me just draw it. I mean, let's say you have the laser. Let's say you have the laser field. I mean, let's not worry about its own di uh, divergence for now. But the moment you put some obstruction, then you are limiting. Then you are limiting how uh, af after the after the slit. Then you are limiting what can be its uh, you know spread in in position uh, uh, space. Now, since you are, since you are limiting this in the position space, its its momentum uh, spread will actually increase from uncertainty or diffraction, however you want to put it. And so the, after this, the beam that we will have, it will be like this. I mean, you know, you know this. So similarly, uh, this, is, this is no different. It is pretty much the same thing. Just because you have, you have a finite size of the beam, right? A laser beam has a finite size. Just because it has a finite size, it has a finite spread in K, okay? So just because it has a finite spread in K, and then if you propagate in Z, you will see that it actually diverges. So this again comes from the Maxwell's equation. This is, this is not something kind of added, but I give you a you know, heuristic kind of explanation that uh, the diffraction or the uncertainty, because it has a finite size, it will actually increase. But it is, it is also uh, uh, connected with this uh, paraxial wave equation because uh, uh, see, mostly in beam-like solution, what you are doing is the Z is being treated separately. So things do change as a function of time. Uh, so, I mean, if, if that makes you happy, then I can stop here. If not, then I can you know, go on uh, more. But this is probably the best explanation I could do for you know, why a beam diverges. Is that, is that okay? So you, you are saying that the uh, spread in momentum would lead to a divergence, but the divergence is in position, so. Um, yes, divergence is in position, but see, uh, this, this beam, this beam has a momentum spread, right? Now, correct, yes. Uh, this beam has a, Okay, this I think I'm finding hard to answer this question without uh, uh, having some illustration to kind of prepare for it, but that's okay. See, a momentum, how we could represent, uh, so a momentum, oops, sorry. It, momentum is what? A, a beam, sorry, let's say K naught. You know, so this is, this is a plane wave or sing, beam having just a single momentum, okay? So this has an infinite spatial extent. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you are aware of this. Whenever we say to the e to the i k x, e to the i k not x, it, it is of this type. Okay. So this beam has an infinite extent in x, and that's the x direction. Yes. Okay. But I can also have, uh, let's say. another one in X. And this direction I will call K or maybe I think the better way of will be, I think this is also okay. So that's a K one. Okay, and similarly, you can have, a, you know what I mean, right? K2. So all these beams, uh, these have infinite extent in X. But, uh, but the uh, directions are different, okay? Now, and again, I, ha I have just done this, but you can also have 
the opposite, the negative K. K1 prime, and we can also have that's k2 prime okay now what you actually have when you have a beam what you actually have is that all these k vectors are superposed okay so when i'm saying sorry i have to Okay, so when I'm saying that this beam has a uh, finite uh, momentum spread, what does that mean? That it has a lot of momentum component, okay? And what I have drawn here, these are the uh, possible momentum component that you can have. So when you represent the field in the position basis, you're essentially adding all these momentum uh, component. So although I have drawn only five, but you know momentum, uh, uh, component will be infinite. It'll have an infinite, uh, you know, number of them. With this, I mean, ha having some finite width, let's say delta k or something. Now, when you add uh, momentum, uh, uh, you know, all, all this momenta in in this spread at z equal to zero, they have one type of uh, position distribution. Let's say they, they, they you, you will find that they are of this size. But the same same uh, uh, same momenta with exactly the same spread. If you add at a different z, they will have a different spread in x, and that is an, another way of saying that you can have uh, you know the, the the you have the beam divergence. So the momentum content of the beam at z equal to zero and at z equal to let's say z is exactly the same. It it has not changed, but the way they add at different z gives them a different size tra transfer size at different z is that is that fine uh, okay so it's like, it's like I, I, I don't understand uh, why they are being added differently at different z but okay. uh, maybe okay. i have to read okay. it. no no that's fine that i can explain so it's like it is the i k not x right this is this is this is the phase this is the phase, uh, let's say right at some z equal to zero. But as this yes. plane wave, as this plane wave propagates, it picks up another phase, okay? Uh, maybe some, so here we have this GUI phase. This, the, this, this is for the whole beam. Now this phi z, uh, this, this picks up another phase phi z, okay? So every beam, right? If, sorry, every momentum component picks up a different phase as it propagates. So although you have, let's oh, say okay. in, in this example, although you have this five component only, but the superposition will have different phases added to them at this point. And hence, when you add them up, it will have a different structure or, or different position uh, yes, uh, uh, wave function. Is that fine? Mm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Got it. Thank you. So. So again, uh, this beam divergence is very fundamental. There is no way getting around it. This is limit, uh, This is connected as I explained to the diffraction or you can also say uncertain relation. So that's where it comes from. Okay, so anything else anybody has on this one as to what it means? So the, the, these are the basic features of, of a Gaussian beam. And then if you look at its uh, intensity profile rather transverse intensity profile on the Gaussian beam, it is of uh, uh, this type. So intensity is essentially proportional to this amplitude, amplitude square. Uh, again, this is not equal, but uh, this is just proportional. And so if you go back here, you know, you have this uh, I term here. So if you take the mod square of E, this will go away. Uh, this also has I term. So again, if you take mod square, this term will go away. So we'll stand, if you take the mod square of this, we'll essentially have the mod square of this and the mod square of that. And hence we have this uh, a squared, which is just constant, and then W squared Z. And then from the other term, we have this exponential minus twice X squared plus Y squared by W squared Z. W squared, W, as I said, this is the uh, size of the beam at a given Z. And W naught is the size of the beam 
at its waist z equal to 0 or is the minimum size okay so that's the transverse intensity of the beam okay now we saw that the beam divergence for a diffraction limited ideal uh, field is this lambda by pi w naught but if you do not have an uh, ideal uh, field or a beam it is not no longer pi by lambda by pi omega naught you have a factor this showing up m square you know, m square is called the quality factor this is the beam quality factor as you know how, how good a beam is so if you buy a new laser they will mention this beam quality factor if you want a nice gaussian diffraction limited beam you want m square to be uh, equal to one i mean if it's less than 1.1 and that's okay uh, but you, if, if it's 10 or something that means it's highly 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 multi-moded so unless you want that uh, multi-moded for some application uh, uh, it is that that will not be good for a single mode application if you uh, are getting it so the, the, these are the things that one needs to take care of when one is buying a laser okay so m square is the quality factor again why it comes how it comes i, I will not be going in, into all that but uh, uh, if, if it is not an ideal diffraction limited beam then m square will not will be more than one it can't be less than one okay now we come to uh, the main topic which is the measuring the width uh, of, of, of a gaussian beam real i have written you know what you see in the lab and so on so here I've redrawn the same figure. Now we have a laser, but the way I have drawn is that this minimum, minimum beam size you don't find at the face of the laser. So it can occur at some z equal to a. Okay. So uh, I mean, essentially it focuses like this. Earlier the laser fa face was like this here, but now the laser face has shifted. So what comes out of the laser is not a you know the the this this uh, uh, I mean the beam waste is not at z equal to zero. It happens after a distance, uh, 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 you know, a from z. It can actually happen inside the laser as well. It, th that means a could actually be a negative number as well. Okay. So we have seen when a is not equal to zero. Uh, this is the expression for the uh, this is the expression for the beam waste, which we can rewrite as w naught square lambda by pi w naught square z square. So it is the same expression. I'm just rewriting it. Uh, w square z is equal to w naught square. 1 plus z square by z naught square so z for z naught square if you substitute this then you can write it like that so w square z is w naught square that means the waste at uh, z equal to zero and then this is due to the uh, propagation and so at, at, at you looking at the beam size at z then this is the extra that shows up now if you have if you have that a is not equal to zero and also that the quality factor is not equal to one it is some m then the beam size has this expression again i'm not deriving it you just take it from me if you uh, want it you can take any standard text uh, and see this derivation but i mean one quick note you can see that here for this here for this z we are essentially adding z minus a this is for I mean, because it is essentially you know shifting the whole thing by a so you can just put an a here and for this divergence lambda by pi omega naught we add this m square here okay just just when you have the uh, beam quality factor is not equal to one then this divergence becomes this so similarly for this ideal case where the divergence is lambda by pi w naught here we are adding lambda by pi w naught m square and since this is square this becomes m4 times lambda by pi w naught square so this is the beam size as a function of z when a is not equal to zero and quality factor is not equal to one of course this is if if if, if a becomes zero and m square becomes one then you can see this expression essentially is that expression there's no difference okay so that is the uh, uh, expression for the beam size or the beam uh, width at different z now there are different ways of measuring the beam uh, width of a laser so i mean now there are more modern techniques where you don't need to do all these uh, uh, you know difficult procedure but the ideas you know remain the same so if you have a, for example an intensity profile ix as a function of x if this is the this is the intensity profile 
you know, then you look at the maximum peak value, whatever it is, you call it one. And then you look at where the uh, uh, beam has or intensity has gone down to one over E square, which is 0 0.135. And this size, then you call one over E square diameter. Okay, that's the size of the beam. Then some, there's something called D4 lambda width. Uh, how you define it? You have the intensity expression. From this intensity expression, you find the mean in X. You can you, you do the similar thing in Y, but uh, the D4 lambda width in the X direction, you can define it in this manner. So first you define the mean. Mean is this intensity, uh, X times intensity, X I X, and then dividing by, this is normalizing factor. So that's the mean. Once you have the mean, then you do the uh, second moment. So X minus X mean whole square. And then you have this I DX DY, this is normalization. You do it, take the uh, square root, multiply by four, and that's your D4 lambda width. So this is essentially connected to the uh, standard deviation or, or the variance, okay? And then the four times, four times that. So that is also a, a number that gives you idea of the size of the uh, beam. The another one, in fact, there, there are more, there are some seven or eight ways of kind of doing it, but this will be the last one. So there's something called 1090 knife edge width. So what, what that is? Uh, so, I mean, now you have a, you have professional kind of cameras which, which can directly get the beam size, but, but when, you know, CC, such CCD cameras were not there, then this, this is how people were actually uh, measuring the beam width. Uh, and uh, the, the professional cameras, are doing the same thing. It is just that the user interface is not as much. You just, you know, use it and kind of get it. You don't have to do the hard work. The hard work is done by the camera and the associated software. But this is the, this is the principle uh, that, that either you can use it manually or you can use it in an automated manner. That is the camera. So uh, this, this is how it works. So if you have, if you have the intensity of the intensity of the laser beam uh, given by this, any, any question at this point? Again, if you find, if you know it already, I can go a little faster. Uh, if you find, uh, I need to slow down, just let me know. So uh, here, this is the intensity expression that we have. Again, I can connect this to, this is the intensity expression I'm rewriting. That's the, that's the intensity expression we had. The same intensity expression I'm writing here. Now the total total optical power in the beam is when I integrate this whole field, whole intensity in the transverse direction, that means dx dy. So you see, I'm not integrating in the z direction because that is the propagation direction. So if you, if you have a you know, screen and the beam falls onto that, then how much is the intensity on that area? So that's the transverse uh, uh, you know, uh, intensity we are talking about. And the, when you integrate the, that over the area, that gives me the power. I mean, integrate that over the whole area, that gives me the total power. So you can actually see the total power is this. If you put in these expressions, I'm just taking this out. Then you are left with this. This is a standard integral pi by two wz. And if you put in there, this uh, total power is essentially a square pi by two. Okay, so for the beam that we had considered, uh, the total power is essentially a square by a square pi by two. And you could uh, feel reassured because then now you see this total power doesn't depend on Z. Oh, sorry, this is actually, I said it doesn't depend on Z, but my two looks like a Z. So this is actually two and not Z. So this, this doesn't depend on Z, which makes sense because uh, I mean, beam is just uh, uh, diverging, but total energy should remain the same. Hence total power is same. Now, what, now in order to measure the size of the beam, the way you do is that in this transverse beam, you put a uh, knife edge you know, and you slide this knife edge across and then you look at what that power is. So, so if, you, if you, knife edge essentially means that we are blocking the beam. So here, for example, uh, I, have, I have this beam going like this. So this is the transverse power we are talking about. You now you put a screen and the power in this uh, whole area. And next what you do is you bring in knife edge. 
So for example, this is like an obstruction. Okay, so this obstructs this beam. So now you have this beam will get blocked here, uh, but this, this is fine. I mean, so you have beam something like this. You have beam only in this area, okay? So uh, this much beam you are actually cutting off, okay? So the total power will then, total power from this point on will actually decrease. And again, if you uh, uh, bring this in even more, for example, if I have it until this, that's a knife edge, then I'm blocking pretty much the entire beam. And then that what I have left is like this size. So you see the total power in this, this is the total complete total power, the I naught or P naught, PT, but this will just be a fraction of the total power. So we'll measure this uh, uh, total power as a function of this X. That means location of the knife edge. Okay, let me just get rid of this. Okay, and uh, here what I have is just a simple derivation for this PX when the knife edge is at X. So since there's no knife edge in the Y direction, so we are still integrating Y from negative infinity to infinity, but X we are integrating from X to infinity. Uh, this you can write as P total. That means you integrate everything from X, Y from negative infinity to infinity, but then you subtract off this part minus infinity to X, okay? So this is just a different way of writing it. There's no uh, difference in these two. So you have this PT coming back again here. Uh, this expression, uh, this double integral I'm breaking into two. This is the X integration. This is the Y integration. This Y integration is simply, I'm using the, what we had done here, this integral, this result. So this is just root pi by two WZ. And this you have to kind of integrate. This is in terms of a error function. Most of you might know what an error function is. And if you do the whole thing, uh, this is the expression for PX that you get, okay? So that the, uh, the, the, the power when the knife edge is at X uh, is, is given by this expression where PT is the total power. Okay, and you have this uh, WZ. That means there's a, Z is a plane where you are doing this experiment, X is the X coordinate. Now, once you have this in experiment, what do you do? You measure this PX as a function of, uh, as a function of X, uh, then you will kind of get this kind of a curve. Okay, and then the, uh, zero point, I mean, you would you get the highest intensity, define that as one, and then you take the 0 0.9 uh, uh, times that intensity, where, wherever that comes, you take the point where the, it is 0 0.1 times that intensity, and this width is called the 1090 knife edge width, okay? So, um, any question here? Because I think I'm done with the theory part. Okay, so what, what you're going to do is, is basically measure this uh, knife edge width. And I think uh, in some part of the manual, you are also being asked to uh, measure the one square, one over E square diameter, and this one just for the comparison purposes. And uh, uh, you essentially have to use the knife edge method uh, to kind of get the beam size at different Z, 10 different Z values, okay? And from 10 different Z value, then you fit in with this formula, with some lab U or MATLAB, and then try to uh, extract these numbers A and M or M square. Okay, that is the first experiment. Okay, any any question at this point? I mean, exactly how to do is also uh, given in the manual, but this is uh, you know overall the, the the experiment is. Again, if you were doing this in the lab, it would have been a very simple trivial experiment. But again, since we are doing it. Uh, in the uh, at home with the kit with the limited resource, uh, this will be a little challenging. So now, what I well, I'm not going to do the entire experiment. But I, I can show you what I, I how I would go about, uh, you know, to do this. So let me stop sharing it.
Uh, what do I do? Okay, sorry, hang on. Right. So you so I'm I'm kind of logged in from my uh, Yeah, can somebody confirm if you're seeing my uh, uh, phone video? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Okay, so this is how I have tried setting up. Uh, I'm not sure how this will work out. Okay, so this is this is the laser, and that's the screen that I have. And this is screen, if you see, is a simple cardboard. I have put a let's see, uh, just a. Hmm. Uh, just a piece of paper on each side, and then this two kind of clip, so that it kind of holds here. And then I also have this uh, book end to kind of hold it. So again, I'm, I'm not taking the measurement. So I'll just uh, trying to demonstrate what you can. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a very nice screen for me that I have. Uh, okay, now uh, that's the laser. So what I have done again, another clip. This clip I'm just uh, using right at the laser, <laughs> and then that keeps it on uh, continuously, and that's what we want. I have these two blades here. I was just trying single slit uh, uh, diffraction pattern. So here is just one blade. There's another one, and I'm just trying to put it, you know, as close as I can, and trying to get the sorry and trying to get the uh, single slit, but that is for some of the day. So here, there is a scale that I have, and that scale uh, that I'm using this clay dough, and then uh, we can see the marking. But there is a problem which I will point out. Hang on. Sorry, there was a phone call and hence it went there. Okay, so this is my laser, very stable uh, with this clip and it's not moving. Uh, and then somebody, if you have pretty intense beam, for example, I was using just my goggle. So I think we'll have to use one of these, you know, Jugard or whatever to kind of do these experiments. So I was... So you could put these here to kind of attenuate the intensity if you need it. If not, uh, right now, since I don't need to record it, I don't need to worry about it. But this is one thing I think you could see 
remove it, it's pretty intense. It's not that intense. In fact, you see the intensity more in the reflection, I guess. Anyway, so this I don't need. Uh, now, so I am not giving you any hint here on the most difficult part, but uh, mostly then again, I have this, uh, uh, this, this blade on, the, on this clay dough. And then uh, this is the scale. And now I am, I kind of make sure that this is the convenient height that I can block the beam. So now if I bring it, Let me just turn off the light, room light, maybe then it will be slightly better. Probably it's too dark, but I guess you can still see. So this is the whole beam without me being blocking anything. And now we have to find, we slowly move the beam across, then you can see you'll start blocking the beam. Just a tiny bit, just keep going. And now the whole beam is blocked, okay? So again, you do have the background and that we will have to see, but it is essentially the, uh, it is essentially the, again, if you move too much, you go to the other side. But this, this is right now, this position, the beam is completely blocked. And if you bring it back, Again, it comes out. Now this, it, it is not blocked at all. So uh, we have to get the total power. So we are not looking for any diffraction pattern or anything. It is a total power that we are after. So you start blocking the beam and you have to just, you just have to have some way of kind of measuring where the beam is, sorry, where the blade is or the knife edge is. So some way of measuring where exactly this, uh, you know, this, this tip is or so the edge is, and then start moving this, and then you block it partly, and then keep going, and then it's completely blocked. And at each point, you measure the total intensity, and then plot it as a function of x. Again, if you were doing this in the lab, it would have been a trivial thing, but now even measuring the intensity as a function of x, that becomes very uh, rather non-trivial, but we'll see. Any, any question here? How we'll measure the intensity we could see on your board uh, using the Firefox app. Like we'll take a camera over there and. Yeah, so I think that that for that part you'll have to be the few few options and few ideas that we have provided. And as I said, so so that is I think one question for which we have some answer. But I think as I as as I was setting this experiment up, you know what came to me and I don't have a solution for that yet. So see, this is this is a blade I have now. I think maybe this is a better view. I think this is a better view. Yeah. So see, I have this blade, and this is the this is the scale that I'm putting. But this is a millimeter. Millimeter is the best that I can get over this on, on the scale. So I was thinking I can just put it, you know, slide it across very slowly. And then I can then read off that number. But then a minimum I can read off is one millimeter. Maybe with my eye, I can get half a millimeter, you know. But this beam will be just a millimeter or two, maximum one millimeter. Now with one minute, half a millimeter resolution, how do you find a <laughs> beam that is one millimeter in size itself? So at least you have to have some uh, 100 micron or 50 micron. That's the kind of resolution. Uh, that's the kind of precision with which you should be able to move, the, uh, move this knife edge. So I think we'll see, uh, I, 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 at this point, I don't have a solution for this. I mean, in, in the lab, we have, a, we have translation stages you know, which can go up to 10 micron or so. And then it's very easy. You just put it there and do it. But if I'm moving it by hand, at least what I'm doing right now, uh, that will not be sufficient. It will give you very, very, very noisy uh, data. So that will be, that will be another uh, kind of a, uh, a question that will be much more uh, kind of difficult to answer at this point. So we have to come up with uh, some you know, way of, uh, and again, if somebody comes with a way, maybe you, you could share with others. So that's how I think this lab will be this year. It will be really experimental, you know, in, in, in that sense. 
But for, for the intensity, yes, we have given several, you can have the Firefox, you could put the ca camera directly there, or you can just put a piece of paper, take a photo, and then use that NIH software to read off the intensity values. So, so for, 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 for that, it is uh, measuring intensity is still okay. Again, as I said, what you can have done in five minutes in the lab will take a half an hour or maybe you know, two hours doing that. But I think that will be the fun part. And then we'll see that you know, if people maybe come out with different ways of, uh, newer ways of doing things, uh, and maybe that way the learning will be more. So that is our hope this time. Any other question? Or did I answer your question? Uh, I, I forget who it was. Like, um, the only confusion was like, how will we measure the intensity? Like either taking the phone there or- No, no, so, so for intensity, I think uh, Harsh Vardhan Professor Vanre, he gave a talk, you know, one, one hour talk. We have it, 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 that on the YouTube. Yes, so MNJ, like- Yes, yes, yes. So different methods. Again, if you come up with your own method, we will take that as well. So uh, there, there are few ways that uh, we, we have provided, in, you know, uh, as to how you can measure the intensity. But if you come up with your own method, perfectly fine. And in that case, you can share with everybody in that MOOCIT forum. And then, you know, it will be learning for all. So that is what we are after. You know, learning is the goal this year. Again, as I said, for that, we have provided some answer solution, but how to move this knife edge, you know, across. I don't have a very good solution. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for uh, uh, you know, others to, yes. So uh, the resolution we're looking for, like, is a hundred micron pushing it, uh, is that enough? I would think, yes, because this beam vest, uh, the, the size of this laser beam is not more, maybe a millimeter or two, maybe. Or maybe let's so, say even three millimeters. If, if you want to measure something three millimeter, you know, and want to fit some function, you know, that error function or something, then uh, you better have at least five, six, seven, maybe at least 10, 15 points. Yeah. And, and, and that 10, 15 point, it should be completely accurate. You know, here your accuracy is one millimeter. So I could put it one millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter. But let's say when I'm using a scale, if I'm putting it at 1.5 millimeter, my accuracy will not be as much. Then I will be completely unsure whether it is 1.4 millimeter, 1.6 millimeter, or even whether it is 1.7 millimeter. You know, when, I, when I'm saying it is 1.5 with my eye approximation and that uh, stupid scale, it will be anything between 1.3 millimeter to 1.7 millimeter. And so that's the, that's the uh, you know, inaccuracy you have in, the, in, 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 in putting your knife edge. So, um, so the, the, these are the limitations, yes. But again, if I had the translation stage, that, that gives me a resolution of 10 micron, very precise. And then it would be perfect for measuring you know, something that is one millimeter. Okay, other question? Okay, I, if you, there are a few things in chat. I think I haven't, since I have too many things to, uh, maybe if we can just speak up, maybe that will be, uh, you know, easier for me to uh, uh, handle. So yeah, if you just have a question, just unmute and speak, uh, you know, speak up. Somebody suggesting we can build a contraption using screws to push the blade. Yeah, perfect. The pitch of a screw thread will be of the order of one millimeter. So it might not really help. Pitch of a screw thread. Yeah, that is, yeah. I was also thinking of some kind of screw. Uh, no, the screw uh, thread, the, the pitch will be, pitch of a screw thread is one millimeter. That is true, but uh, you, can, you can rotate that screw uh, with, 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 with much smaller uh, number. I mean, you know, so you, you, you don't read off from the pitch of the screw. You, you read off from, you know, by what angle uh, you, you have rotated it. So that could also be another solution, but you, can, you control the angle, exactly. You control the angle 360 degree. So if you have, controlling the angle is actually easy and that is precisely the screw gauge, yes. Somebody is saying screw gauge, yes, yes. So that could be another solution. But again, these are the solutions that people have to come with. Again, we have not provided you uh, anything in this kit uh, as, as a solution for this. So one has to come up with, um, you know, something for this. Yeah, somebody was saying something. Hello? Any other question? We can use a bottle cap or something for that purpose. Oh, I don't know. Uh, 
what that's what the suggestion mean but yeah if, if whatever works <laughs> i think uh, as long as we see uh, uh, some 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 solution i think we, we have to come up with for this yes okay so it's almost wait, three three minutes past four so if there's no other question we can stop here so uh, let me know if anybody has any question quickly all right so we will stop here uh, i'll put this on uh, uh, on YouTube and on Thursday, I think the individual TAs, I think this, this, this week, hopefully there will be no hiccup. Uh, we have uh, kind of fixed that. So sorry about the hiccup last, uh, last week. So this, this Thursday will have the regular uh, interaction uh, with, with the uh, uh, tutorial section with individual TAs. And I think I'll see you uh, uh, next Tuesday. Again, if anybody has, since this is, a, this is actually really experimental uh, this year, anybody has any questions, suggestions, feel free to pass that on. Uh, uh, if you have any question for us, just do write it. If not, if you have something found, if you have found out something, put that on, on, on uh, you know, the forum for every, everybody to kind of uh, see and learn from that. So uh, with that, let me stop here. Again, any question, suggestion, feel free to kind of pass those on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.